Hello and welcome to 3ABN Today Bible Q&A. My name is Angela Lomakang. I'm glad that you've tuned in today. We have a wonderful program for you. And we also have, uh, we have a distinguished panel also, and you will recognize each face when I introduce them. And today we will be answering your questions. Nothing less than a whole Bible can make a whole Christian. <laughs> and that's what we're gonna be Remember. using, the whole Bible. And this is our guidebook that will lead us to eternity. Amen. Well, if you have questions that you'd like to send in, you can do so by texting your questions to us at 618-228-3975, or you can email us at BibleQA at 3ABN.TV, or if you're an Instagram person, you can Instagram us at 3ABN underscore official. All right, now let's go right into uh, I'm going to introduce you to our, our panel. You will recognize them. We're going to start with Pastor John Dinsey. Welcome. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here, and it's a privilege to really look into God's Word, searching for answers and depending on Him to give us the answers. You know, you're right. It's only He can do so. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, Pastor Ryan Day, welcome. Amen. Always a blessing to be on 3ABN Bible Q&A, and I just want to say thank you to all of our viewers who are sending in your questions week after week. It's such a blessing, and it gives us an opportunity sometimes to study new things that perhaps maybe we haven't. That's right. Amen. <laughs> so true. And in front of me... Hello, sweetheart. Hi, honey. <laughs> I stopped flirting on air, but I enjoy it. Anybody to flirt with is your wife. Okay. But um, yeah, the Bible, what's nice about the questions yeah. that you send in, yeah. sometimes we're not even thinking about these kinds right. of questions. And then mm. all of a sudden we think, <laughs> Somebody has a question about that, and then we dive into the Word of God. That's right. Thank you for, as Ryan and, and Pastor Denise said, thank you for challenging us and getting us to go into closets that we don't normally that's open right. by ourselves. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Wow. Well, before I have prayer, I just want to explain to you that we have each panel will have four questions, and they will answer three of three of them uh, in three minutes, and there's one four-minute question that mm -hmm. they will answer. So. Uh, Pastor Ryan, will you open with prayer for us? Absolutely, please? yes. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we certainly need the power of your Holy Spirit right now. We dare not dive into these uh, questions and give superficial answers, Lord, from our own finite human minds. Uh, we don't have the wisdom or the answers, but you do. Your word has them, and that's what we want to stick to today, Lord. Show us in your word. Teach us from your word, and may each and every answer that is given be a reflection of your will and in harmony with the word of God. We give this time to you, and we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. We're going to start with Pastor John Dinsey. And his first question is a four minute question. Okay. So listen up. It says, will a mother's prayer for the forgiveness of her adult child be granted? Job 1 verse 5 says that Job offered sacrifices in case his children had sinned the night before. Does that mean we can offer prayers to forgive sins for other people? Also, I never read anything about women offering sacrifices for forgiveness of sins. Can you expand on that? That's Rosalind sent in that text. Thank you, Rosalind. We'll try to get to that second question if we have time. But uh, the Bible does not teach that we can pray for someone else to be forgiven. There's no text that specifically says that. There are a few verses that seem to kind of give you a hint that uh, people were hoping that God would do this. We may be able to look at some of those, but please remember that God wants to do more than just forgive sins. He wants to change you as well. Uh, consider Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It says, repent. What does repent mean? Repent means to have sorrow for sin and turn away from them. Uh, so let's go. Uh, repent and therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Acts 3.19. In Acts 2.38, Peter said, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So also bringing to your attention, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. The emphasis is on us confessing our sins. So Proverbs 28, 13, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. And this is what God wants to do for each and every per person. In Proverbs, uh, uh, no, Ezekiel 14, 20, it says, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, mm -hmm. as I live, says the Lord, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. So does God take into account that you're praying for your son? I think he does. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that he will uh, extend mercy to that person and try to lead your son to repentance. And this is what your prayers can do. And so um, I would like to bring also to your attention the interesting thing for example, let's say that um, the Hitler's mother is praying for Hitler to be forgiven for all of the murders that he did. Mm. And if that were true, then he would be forgiven. Would you see Hitler going to heaven and being there? He's not changed. He right. will remain the same. So I encourage you to pray for your son to repent, that the Lord will lead him to repentance and that he will accept to repent. In Job chapter 1, verse 5, Actually, let's go to four, 4 and 5. And his sons would go and feast in their houses each on his appointed day and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. So we see that Job apparently called them and sanctified them and apparently appealed to them to be faithful to God in some way. But he was offering sacrifices uh, in the hope that God will have mercy upon them and lead them to repentance is what I understand from this. So I would continue to, I encourage you to continue to pray for your son that he would repent, search for the Lord for all, with all of his heart. And remember, if you're confessing for like the one sin that you mentioned, who knows how many other sins your son may have done. You may be uh, confessing one particular sin, but who knows what's inside his mind. So God wants to change the total person so the person will repent and have a desire to be part of God's family and be transformed. Thank Amen. you. Amen. And we know in the Bible it says, contend with me and I will contend with you in Isaiah 49, verse 25, and I will save your children. So parents, keep praying for your children. I know you do, right? You Absolutely. always pray for Absolutely. your children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing like a parent praying for their children. Thank you for that. Okay. All right, Pastor Ryan, here we go. Under what rights and authority did the Catholic Church have to switch the seventh day Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Can the seventh day Sabbath be switched back to Saturday where it should be? Will God punish the Catholic Church for this switch? This is from Mike in Michigan. Okay, Mike, I appreciate the, uh, the question. And I'm uh, just going to take this piece by piece and answer it as you have presented it. Uh, under what rights and authority does the Catholic Church have to switch the Seventh-day Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday? The answer to that is no right at all. She thinks she has a right. That's what Bible prophecy says. In, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, it tells us very clearly that she thinks and intends to change God's times and laws because she believes, and speaking, when I say she, speaking of the church organization, the hierarchy of the church, uh, believes that it has the authority to be, uh, to basically usurp and be a representative for Christ, the high priest here on earth which we know is absolutely, it flies in the face of God. Mm -hmm. And so she has absolutely no right and authority. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2 says, uh, this is from God himself. He says, you speaking to his church, he says, you shall not add to the word which I commanded you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I commanded you. And so in this case, God is making it very clear. He has not given his people, his church, or any people or any church for that matter, the authority to go change or, or to transfer or to cancel 
cancel anything from his word or from his law. Second part of this question, will, uh, let's see, can the seventh day Sabbath or will it ever be switched back to Saturday? Mm -hmm. The thing is, in heaven, it has never been switched. That's right. Uh, men think that they can switch it, but they haven't. Now here on earth, will it ever revert back globally, I guess, to the, the correct biblical Sabbath? And the answer is no, uh, because the Bible makes it very clear in Bible prophecy that this beast system will deceive the entire world. Go read, read Revelation chapter 3, excuse me, 13. Mm -hmm. Revelation 13 makes it very clear that he deceives the whole world. Mm -hmm. And everyone believes that this beast, this antichrist, Roman papal church state system serves their best spiritual interest. And they are deceived into believing that the changes that they make in God's law mm -hmm. and trying to get rid of the biblical Sabbath and bring about this false Sabbath, they, they go, they're in favor of that. Mm -hmm. And so that actually what ushers in the last part of your question here, which is God's response to anyone, the beast itself, and anyone who worships or follows the beast. Mm -hmm. And uh, notice what it says here. Uh, well, I'll just quote it here. Revelation chapter 18, verse 8 actually says that her plagues mm -hmm. come in one day. Mm -hmm. And we see those plagues. We see that the full wrath of God is poured out upon anyone who worships the beast, receives the mark of the beast, and upon the beast itself. This Roman system will receive uh, a, 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 uh, the wrath of God at the end of time. You can read that in uh, Revelation chapter 16. Now, uh, will it ever be changed back? Well, again, it was never changed in heaven's perspective. Right. But yes, when we get to heaven, it says here in Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23, For as the new heaven and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. It may not be right down here right now, but when we get to heaven, God's going to say it's right now. And it will always remain the way it should be for all eternity when we're in his presence. Man, and you know the Catholic Church, they tell you that they change right. the day. They, we spent time in Rome and we saw mm -hmm. the magnificent place and we were, all these people bowing and all kissing mm -hmm. the toes of the statues and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And you came out of Sunday worship. Mm -hmm. And it was different for you to worship on a different right. day, wasn't it? It was, but when you love truth. Ah, that's When you the love key. truth, you want to follow God with all your heart. Amen. 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 Thank you for that. All right, Pastor John, mm -hmm. are fallen angels demons or are they two different entities altogether? Well, the answer is very, very simple. There is only one devil, but <laughs> because he is the fallen angel. Right. But his angels, those that followed him in his rebellion against God, these are the demons. Right. Demons are also called in scripture unclean spirits or familiar yes. spirits. Mm. So we talk about the fall of the devil. Mm. The Bible says, Revelation 12 verse 9, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. Mm -hmm. And where was he cast? He was cast to the earth and his angels, mm. those are the demons, right. were cast out with him. Luke 10, 18, Jesus describing this event says, and he said, Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Mm -hmm. And then Isaiah 14, verse 12, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morn? And how, are you, how art thou cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nation? Satan's presence and the demon's presence in the earth have weakened the world. Mm -hmm. And then Revelation 12, speaking about this fall continual, it says in Revelation 9, verse 1, then the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. And when you follow that, the pit is open and uh, forms of locusts come out of the pit yeah. describing similar to what happened to the children of Israel in the yes. wilderness. Right. Locusts and scorpions stung them in the wilderness, which is a symbol of demons. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says in Revelation 9 verse 11, and they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, destruction, but in Greek, he has the name Apollyon, the destroyer. Mm -hmm. But the Bible makes it very, very clear that that's describing Satan. Mm -hmm. First Peter 5 verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Once again, there's only one devil, but there are many demons. Mm -hmm. And then Second Peter 2 verse 4 says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, that word the tataros in the Greek, the only time that word is used in the Greek, mm -hmm. and delivered them in chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So the angels are reserved for judgment. And then the Bible in Leviticus 19 verse 31 says, give no heed to mediums 
and familiar spirits, given our regard to mediums and familiar spirits. The mediums are the people that claim to be able to yeah. contact the dead. Yeah. Well, the familiar spirits are called that because they look like family members. Mm -hmm. And demons are able to duplicate images that make you think your family is communicating with you. Mm -hmm. But the Bible talked about them being reserved for judgment. That's why when Jesus cast the demons out of the demon-possessed man, the demons knew Christ, and they said in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 29, uh, Jesus, you son of God, have you come to torment mm. us before our time? Mm -hmm. Well, they yes. knew that they had a time that's reserved for judgment. Yes. So the devil is the only devil, right. but the fallen angels are his demons. That's right. Wow. That was very clear. You said that like a New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> no pizza involved. <laughs> <laughs> so fallen angels are and, demons. Oh, demons. Satan is the devil. Satan, yeah, he's the head over them, isn't he? That's right. Yeah, he's their boss, huh? but they're all fallen. Okay, <laughs> now if you have just tuned in and you would like to send in a Bible question, send it in. You can text us by going to 618-228-3975 or you can email us at BibleQA at 3ABN.TV, or if you're an Instagrammer, you can Instagram at um, 3ABN underscore official. So send your questions in. We'd love to answer them. Okay, Pastor John Dinsey, here we go. How can we correlate Exodus 25 verse 8 with Paul's assertion in Acts 17:24? Very good. Thank you for that question. Uh, I would like to read these verses so that we can all be in the same page. In Exodus 25, 8, it says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now we move to Acts 17, 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Mm -hmm. So we see here, very uh, observant, uh, that you see like it's, it, it, an apparent contradiction. So what do we do with this? Let's go ahead and consider the idea of that we see in the wilderness tabernacle, in the most holy place, that's where God manifested his presence. Mm -hmm. In essence, what God does is uh, go there for a period of time, that he knows how long, and then he goes back to his dwelling place. Mm -hmm. It's not that he is permanently there. God has a dwelling place, and this is why I bring you to 1 Kings chapter 8. Uh, let's go ahead and read verse 26 and 27. And it says, uh, here's Solomon, King Solomon praying, And now I pray, O God of Israel, let your word come true, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. But... Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Mm -hmm. Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. Moving down to verse 38 and 39. He says, whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone or by all your people Israel, when each one knows the plague of his own heart and spreads out his hands toward this temple, then here... In heaven, your dwelling place. Mm. And forgive and act and give to everyone according to all his ways, whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. So we understand from this that just as, uh, as we read, God does not dwell in temples made by hands, mm. but he does manifest his presence as he sees fit. We even uh, remember that Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. And so we understand from this that it is not a permanent residence, but a time where God does manifest his presence when he s deems it necessary. And so we can thank the Lord for his mercy because really if God would manifest his presence <laughs> and all his holiness, mm -hmm. uh, no one would survive. No. Because of mm. his holiness. So, <laughs> yeah. We would be consumed. We would be consumed. Yeah. <laughs> and in heaven, isn't the tabernacle make me a sanctuary? It's a copy of what's in heaven. It's a copy of what's, in, a copy heaven, of what's right? in heaven. That's yeah, right. yeah. Thank you for that. Okay, here we go. Pastor Ryan Day, in Luke 8, Jesus is given a parable about the sower. 
In verse 10, he tells his disciples, in seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. What is the purpose of telling a story if it's not meant for all to understand? <laughs> okay. That's a very, very good question, and I appreciate the question that was submitted. This actually is a perfect example of 2 Timothy 2.15, which says that we need to study to show ourselves approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so sometimes what you find in one gospel uh, is more expounded upon in another gospel. And so don't always bring yourself to a point where you isolate a text in the gospel and think, oh, well, that's all that says, because sometimes God would have used one of the other uh, gospel writers to expound on that. And in this case, that is the issue. Uh, I'm going to read Luke 8 again. It says here, uh, Luke, 8, Luke chapter 8, verse 9 and 10, it says, Then the disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest, notice the words here, it is given in parables. So it's not actually that God is withholding information from them. Uh, actually, what he's trying to do is simplify it for those people who can't understand. Now let's go to the equivalent passage to this in another gospel in the gospel of Matthew because Matthew really expounds on this. It says here in Matthew chapter 13 verse 10 through 15 and we find the answer in this passage. It says, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Now over here it says it's not been given, but over in the other one it says, But to them it has been given in parables. Okay, so again, God is not withholding information. He's just trying to simplify it because He can't speak to these people in the same very clear spiritual manner that He can the disciples because mm -hmm. the disciples have opened themselves up to listen and to hear and to understand. Some of the others have not. Now, where did I get that from? Let's keep reading. It says in verse 12, For whoever has to him more has been, or will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now notice verse 13 and onward. Mm -hmm. He says, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing mm -hmm. they do not see, mm -hmm. and hearing they do not hear, mm -hmm. nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. So Christ is quoting Isaiah, and here's the answer. Hearing you will hear, you shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. Why? Because God is withholding it? No, oh. God, God is not the author of confusion. He is a right. just God. He wants to open up all of the mysteries, all of the answers, but it's not Him that's withholding. It's us that are under the law of what, the, what Paul talks about, the law of sin instead of being led by the Spirit. And why is the case? He says it here, verse 15. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Mm -hmm. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Mm -hmm. And then he says, Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn. Notice right. it's a personal decision. Right. And turn so that I should heal them. So God is not withholding information, but to these corrupt, to this corrupt generation he's speaking of in their time, he's saying, I can't speak to them in the very clear spiritual way that I'm speaking to you. I have to break it down in story format and in parables <laughs> because these people have eyes that can't see and ears that can't hear and minds that cannot spiritually perceive what it is that I need to share. And so he has to speak to them in a way in hopes that it'll reach their heart and open their eyes to their own condition. Wow, well said. <laughs> thank Amen. you. Amen. Wow, thank you for that. Okay, Pastor John, there's your four minute question. Okay. It says, Would you please explain Galatians 3, verse 19 to 21? Which law did Paul mean here? Okay, this well, is Kenneth from Kenya. Wonderful, let's read it first. Galatians 3, 19 to 21. What purpose then does the law serve? And this is a very key part. It was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for only one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Now, let me just make a very important point. Righteousness does not come by the Ten Commandments or by the ceremonial law. Righteousness comes through Jesus Christ. Amen. But the Bible says here, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgression. I did some small research that says the 25 mile per hour speed limit in the school zone was added because people were breaking the law that was already there to slow down. They were driving through school zones 50, 60 miles an hour. They were violating that law. There was never a speed limit of 60 miles an hour. They were violating the law already. 
but another law was added because one was being violated. So the ceremonial law was added because the commandments were violated, but it only had a short duration of time till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and that seed is Christ. So the ceremonial law was added because of transgression, and in its types and symbols and festivals and ceremonies and, and, and meats and drink offerings and washing of ordinances and mm -hmm. all the various sacrifices, it was only to point to the coming Christ. Okay. And in his life, he fulfilled all of those types and symbols. It was added till the seed should come. But then what did that law include? Hebrews 10 verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things can never with these sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. So all the blood that was spilled, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter uh, 10 verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Well, why were there blood of bulls and goats being spilled? Hebrews 9 verse 22. And remember, the commandments have nothing to do with killing animals and shedding no. blood. Hebrews 9.22 speaks about this ceremonial law. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. So this ceremonial law that was added because the commandments were violated and had a certain period of time to last was all the ceremonial systems. It was only for the time present. Hebrews 9 verse 9. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience. They always remember the sin. Mm -hmm. Verse 10 of Hebrews 9, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshy ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. That's until Jesus completes his work. That's the time of reformation. So when Colossians 2 verse 14 is read, people think that that has to do with the commandments, but notice the similarity with Hebrews 9 verse 9 and 10 having wiped out the handwriting of requirements written by Moses in a book right. that was contrary to us and against us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. And notice what they included. So let no one judge you in foods, in drinks, in regards to festivals, a new moon or Sabbaths. There were 23 ceremonial Sabbaths including the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Yom Kippur, we call them today. These were all symbolic Sabbaths, but they were not the weekly Sabbath. And all of these, because they had a short duration of time, it says in verse 17 of Colossians 2, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. And to keep these, you have to be circumcised. But 1 Corinthians 7, 19 says, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. So the commandments of God continue, but the ceremonial law that Paul referred to in Galatians 3, verse 19 to 21 is gone. Why do people get them mixed up, the two because, laws, the because, ceremonial and the Because moral. they don't read the difference in the Hebrew and the Greek. Law is law in English, but right. it's not the same in the Greek and Hebrew. Mm. And one describes ceremonies, the others describe simply, do not, do not, do not. Right, right. Relationship between God and man. Yeah. Okay. And they always, most, a lot of people get those mixed up. So I hope this was clear for you. I hope you understood the answer. Thank you for that, honey. All right, here we go. This, your question, John Dingy, is kind of similar to John. So here we go. The plan of salvation is laid down in types, symbols, and figures. Ezekiel 20, verse 37 states, and I will cause you to pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. What does it mean to pass under the rod? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, it is a good question. I want to know. Thank you for quoting the verse. That helps out. And uh, what does it mean to pass under the rod? Uh, first, I like to mention, you know, you, you, you see in the Bible the picture of a shepherd and he has a staff or a rod. Mm -hmm. You remember, of course, um, uh, that David was a shepherd. He had a staff and rod. And that's why I'm going to read in a moment here uh, Psalms 23. But uh, notice what it says in Leviticus 27, 32. It says, And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. So when you look at this verse, it helps us to understand that to pass under the rod means to be uh, selected and counted uh, and here, in this case, uh, passing under the rod means, hey, 
this tenth belongs to the Lord. So passing under the rod means that, that God is going to cause us to pass under the rod, under the rod to say, you belong to me. I have selected you. You are mine. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And Matthew 25, 32, notice here uh, what Jesus says. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. So there's a separation being made here, and the sheep belong to the Lord. And now let's go to Ezekiel 19, 14, because there's also another interesting aspect of this in considering the rod. Uh, this is you, you quoted Ezekiel 20. I'm going to Ezekiel 19 just before. And, and it says, And fire is gone out of the rod of her branches, which had devoured her fruit, so that she had no strong rod to be a scepter to rule. This is a lamentation and shall be for a lamentation. So a rod is used also to rule. And that's why uh, I bring you now to this Revelation 12:5. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Yeah. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So Jesus has a rod and he will rule the wicked people with a rod of iron. Mm -hmm. But in Hebrews 1, 7 and 8, notice what it says. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the son, he says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So God's scepter is a scepter of righteousness. His rod is a rod of righteousness. Moving to Ezekiel 20 again, uh, notice the context that it was presented there. You read 37, I'm going to 33, and it says, As I live, says the Lord your God, the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out, will I rule over you? God uses his staff to rule. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries where you are sc scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. And if you continue to read down, in Ezekiel 20, you will notice that God is bringing them to his holy mountain and they are kept safe because God has a rod of righteousness. Wow, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> While you were talking, I looked that up also. And, it, and the question was, what was a rod or staff used for? Mm -hmm. And it's used for drawing sheep together in an right. intimate relationship, that's which right. is so special. And I love that. And that's why it says yes. in Psalm 23, 4, thy rod and thy, thy staff, staff, they, they comfort, comfort me. me. Ooh, amen. Praise God. I love it. Thank you. Praise what God. a mighty God we serve. That's right. Okay. Oh boy, Ryan Day, you got an interesting <laughs> question. It's so interesting, it has to be a four minute question. <laughs> be gentle, be kind. Oh yeah, yeah, here goes. Are there biblical references to support the use of cannabis for medical purposes? This is from Naomi in Canada. Hit it. <laughs> okay. This is, this is one of those questions that I've gotten a couple of times over the years. Actually, Naomi, thank you for submitting this because it actually is a big issue. I've met many, many Christians who say, hey, I think it's totally okay. And they'll, they'll justify it by using Genesis 129. And God said, see, I have given you every herb <laughs> of the uh -oh. field that yields seeds, uh, which is on the face <laughs> of the earth and on every tree, uh, fruit yields, the fruit that yields the seed, and you sh it shall be for you for food. And so there's people that I've had people come to me and say, yeah, God gave every herb. So uh -huh. it's okay to, to smoke a little bit of weed or a little bit of marijuana. <laughs> uh, and, and the truth of the matter is we have to understand that there are certain situations, certain uh, things in the Bible that's not explicitly addressed, but yet we have to apply biblical principle to. For instance, nowhere in the Bible do we find where God says, you know, thou shalt not, you know, use marijuana or, or thou shalt not use heroin or thou shalt not, you know, eat chalk. Or, or something like that. I'm just using an example. God, God's not going to address certain issues like that, but yet we have, it has to fall under a particular biblical principle. Now, where are those principles? Um, first of all, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and read verses 16 and 17. That's a great place to start. It says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So are there things that we can participate in, put into our body that can defile or harm our temple that God takes very seriously? 
Absolutely. Even in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, God says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Well, if we can eat and drink or indulge in what, something that's going to bring glory to God, then that means uh, just by process of reciprocation, you can indulge in something that does not bring glory to God. And in this case, I believe cannabis falls under that because of all of the medical studies and the, and the cases that have been shown, uh, you are indulging or you are taking into your lungs and into your body carcinogens mm -hmm. and elements that are very, very harmful. Just simply do the research on what it is that you're smoking if you're smoking this. Um, another text here, just to be clear, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. I'm not going to read all these, but verse 4 says, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. And some people will use that text and say, uh -huh. See, as long as I pray over yeah. it and I give God thanks for it. But verse 5 is the key verse. It says, If it is sanctified by the word of God That's and right. prayer. Uh, God did not, uh, even though God created poison, an ivy and technically it's an herb or it's a plant of the field. Are you going to go smoke or eat poison ivy? No, because it's not made for consumption. Same thing with cannabis or with marijuana. Now, uh, I just want to mention this because I know I'm going to get a billion messages on this and they're going to say, but Ryan, what about CBD oil? It oh, doesn't yeah, yeah. have the, you know, oh, the yeah. psychoactive ingredient in it. And I'm going to try to pronounce this tetrahydrocannabinol. I guess that's how you say it, which <laughs> is the, the thing that makes you high oh, yeah. in cannabis. But in some CBD oils, they remove that and they have studies have shown and certain cases have shown that it has helped with you know it's been an anti-seizure medication it's been it's helped with epilepsies and schizophrenias and multiple sclerosis and some anxieties but here's the thing we have to do our research and be clear on this before we put something in our body uh, if you also do the credible research you'll find that some CBD oils have found to have risks such or uh, side effects such as dry mouth diarrhea reduced appetite drowsiness and fatigue and it's even interacted with certain blood thinner medications and many other things. Again, I'm not a doctor and I'm not trying to prescribe anything. I'm just putting the information out there that there's going to be some people that say, well, I don't smoke it, but I may take it in the form of an oil or I may take it in the form of a pill or whatever it is. Uh, just make sure you do your research. The principle is if it does not build a health, if it does not help uh, nourish and it does not help to heal, but rather it does harm to your body, then it falls under the principle that you are defiling your temple. And so make sure you do your research before you just go putting anything into your body. When you, when you light up a cigarette or light up marijuana, you are, you are literally breathing in the fumes of burnt grass. And God <laughs> does not want you breathing in the carcinogens no. and, and, the, and the horrible gases from burnt grass. Leave it alone. Breathe the fresh air God has given yes. you and, eat and, and indulge in those things that God has given you for good health. Amen. <laughs> what about uh, when you travel with that CB, with that oil? Don't take it with you when you travel either, right? That's right. That's why one of the be. persons ended up in Russia, they were uh, arrested. Out. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right, okay. they were, yeah. Right. Do your research. Yeah, do your research. Do your research. Thank <laughs> you. Well said. All right, here we go. Pastor John, when we were kids in church, our teacher asked us, who killed Ananias and his wife? Was it God, Paul, Satan, the Holy Spirit, or did they kill themselves? Mm. <laughs> Well, let me lighten the answer. They didn't kill themselves. Matter of fact, they didn't want to die, I'm pretty no, sure. Right. Well, let me just go ahead and read the story very quickly. Mm -hmm. I'll just give you the surrounding. Yeah. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a pledge going on in Anna, Nice and Sapphira. Like many people got caught up in the excitement of the moment. They said, I will give the proceeds of the land that I sell. I'll give it all to the church for this particular function. And God blessed it tremendously. So be very careful when you make a pledge. The Bible says it's better not to vow than to vow and not to pay. Mm -hmm. Do not allow your mouth to cause your flesh to sin and say before God it was a mistake. Right. So don't get caught up in the excitement of the moment if you can't afford it. But the Bible says in Acts 5 and verse 3, but, but Peter said, Ananias, when he came to the church, he brought a certain part in verse 4 mm -hmm. to the feet of uh, Peter. Uh, verse 2, he brought a certain part in verse 3 of Acts 5. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price? Mm. Wasn't it yours? Did God force you to do this? No. While it remained, was it not yours? And the Bible says, and then Ananias, hearing these words, the Bible says, hearing these words in verse 5, fell down and breathed his last. Mm. So great fear came upon those who heard it. Now, yes. let me just point out very quickly, I did some research behind this, and you might wonder, well, why did God meter out punishment so quickly? Right similar to the instance with Uzzah. 
Some people think that uh, judgment has no immediate impact. In some cases, it does. Ryan talked about that. There are some people that take drugs and never survive that first hit, True. whatever the drug may be. But the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the Son of Man is fully set in them to do evil. The Lord wanted to make it very clear as the church was being established, the New Testament church, God was not standing for double-hearted liars in his church. It was a clear cut. Right. Do not establish the church on the foundation of deception. Mm -hmm. Three hours later, his wife came in, Sapphira. <laughs> the same thing happened to her. And they said, see the feet of the men that buried your husband? Yeah. You've also lied. And the Bible made it very clear. They not only lied unto the Holy Spirit, but it says in verse 4, they lied to God. Now, we have to make a very important point here. Young people, let me just make a point here. In this generation of rebellion, where they don't listen to their parents, they want yeah. to do things that are immoral, they want to leave, leave the house and live how they want. Yeah. Well, the Bible says, you can do whatever you want. You can rejoice in your youth, but know this, for all that God will bring all into right. judgment. Yeah. So the judgment was meted out by God, as in 2 Samuel 6, verse 7, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him with, because of his error. And now it was not an error, it was his intention. Wow. And in the Bible, error means because of his sin, mm -hmm. and he died there by the ark of God. So what does the Bible say? The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. And the gift of God is eternal life. Sometimes that wage is immediately applied because people's hearts are rebellious. So don't play with God. God is serious. Amen. Wow. And lying to the Holy Spirit. And you can't be saved if you lie to the very one that's trying to convict you of your right, sin. Right, right. Yes. It's not good. Wow, thank you for that. Okay, Pastor Dinsey, this question's for you. Here we go. I am a Seventh-day Adventist, but my husband is not. I am not working at the moment, but my husband does. I have shared many times with him about tithing. And though he seems to understand, he still does not tithe. Am I also guilty if he does not tithe? Because his salary is the only income we have every month. Thank you so much. This is a very good question, and I'm sure many people have the same question. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you're doing what you would say your duty according to the scriptures. Uh, the Bible tells us that we should uh, exhort one another in love. And I encourage you to continue to do that and also to highlight the blessing mm -hmm. of returning tithe and giving an offering to the Lord. Look into Malachi. It says that he will pour you out a blessing that there will not be room enough to contain it. But that should not be the reason why we do these things. It should be because we love the Lord and recognize that he is blessing us to be able to have food upon our table, a place to live, and the things we need. In gratitude, we should return tithe. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to point out to Ezekiel 33, 8 and 9, when I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely <laughs> die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked mm -hmm. to turn away from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. In essence, we see the principle here that you have warned your husband, you have uh, exhorted him mm -hmm. uh, about the importance of tithing. Mm -hmm. uh, ask the Lord for uh, wisdom in approaching him in a loving way yeah. so that he will understand there is a blessing for our family if you do tithe. So I encourage you to do this. Uh, in Jeremiah 31, 30, but everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. Now, in essence, uh, you've already done your part yes. if he continues to be uh, in disobedience to God's expressed uh, command, then uh, you have delivered yourself and he is the one that is in danger. Right. So no, you are not, you are no. not going to be, uh, as, as you stated in your question, uh, am I also guilty? You are not guilty. No. You are innocent. Mm -hmm. But I would also say to you that it is, again, a blessing to restore, I mean, to, to return to the Lord Amen. of that which he has given us. And uh, I have, I have, uh, I've heard of, of people that say that this is not in the New Testament. Some people say, oh no, that's oh, not in the yeah. New Testament. We don't have to tithe. But remember that Jesus says, uh, you tithe uh, mint and rue and anise. 
And it's, Jesus says, these things you ought to hate, uh, have done, but not to leave the others undone. Right. So Jesus in this verse is saying, yes, you can tithe on mint, rue, and anise, but don't leave the others undone. So yes, we are still to tithe. Uh, this world is not over. No. God still wants to bless you. Yes. If you return your tithe to the yes. Lord, He will bless you more than you can handle. Amen. <laughs> And that's how our church prospers as a ministry, worldwide church, is yes. through the tithe. Yes, that's what helps the gospel continue yes. to go forward. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is more blessed to give than to receive, isn't it? All right, thank you for that. All right, Pastor Ryan Day. Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> is it wrong to clap? for special music in church? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the answer is it depends. <laughs> it depends on what your motivation is behind clapping. Who are you clapping for? Um, I'll, I'll answer it by also asking a question. Is it wrong to sing in church? And some people say, well, that's different, Ryan, because in the Bible we see singing is a good thing. It was incorporated into the church service. But what if I show up and I sing and it's not for the Lord? or it's for myself, or there's a different uh, uh, carnal motivation behind why I'm singing uh, at church. Again, that's where Jesus would say, in vain they do worship me. That's a, a vain form of worship yes. and therefore not accepted by the Lord. Um, I, there's a general principle that we need to follow when we're dealing with issues like this. Is it wrong to clap for special music? Um, first of all, let me read John chapter 3, verse 30. Very short, very quick, but a powerful message. He must increase and I must decrease. That's right. Amen. Everything we do in church must be God motivated. It must be for Him and about Him at all times. And so is it just uh, wrong in general to clap your hands? Well, there are a couple of texts in Scripture that give a positive context to clapping hands. For instance, Psalm 47 verse 1 says, Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to the Lord with the voice of the triumph. And you say, but Ryan, that's not for the church service. I, I would disagree <laughs> because it actually says right before this, praise to God, the ruler of the, of the earth to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. So this was to the chief musicians for the purpose of leading out in worship. So is it wrong if a brother or sister finishes a powerful song mm -hmm. and I clap my hands? It depends yeah. at that moment. Who am I clapping my hands for? Mm -hmm. Am I clapping my hands in praise for God? Thank you, Lord, for that powerful message. Thank you, Lord, for the talent that you give your singers. Or am I clapping because, oh, brother so-and-so, look at him up there. You know, <laughs> there's a different motivation yeah. behind that and we have to keep yes. ourselves in check. There are also multiple texts in scripture that talk about clapping of hands in a negative context. Most of the time it's, a, it's, it's in scorn against those people who are living a life of sin or who have turned their back on God. So there are, a, a, there are times when you can clap that's not appropriate and we need to keep ourselves in check. Remember, he must increase and I must decrease. Keep the clapping for God, not for men. Amen. 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 It's for him. That's right. right. He's to get all glory. the praise, not us. Thank you so much, the singer in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, honey. Oh, boy. Here's a loaded question for you, honey. Pastor John, here we go. Where in the Bible does it state that pornography is wrong? It's just set in the mood, I suppose, between a husband and mm. wife. <laughs> wow, okay, well done. You know, when we saw this question, I said, I have to answer this question. I know. Pornography is sexual immorality. Right. Pornography is not for the purpose of setting the mood for you and your spouse mm -hmm. because it is entering into your mind and molding the way you think. And the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So don't put pornography in your mind that belongs to the Lord. Now, you may say it's setting the mood and you may not be the one that's participating in that immorality on the screen, but in Paul, in Romans chapter one, he talks about immorality, men with men, women with women. He talks about the immorality that preceded the antediluvian's destruction. And then he says in verse 32 of Romans chapter one, who knowing the righteous judgments of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. But notice what he says not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Mm. So you may not be the one on the screen. You know, marriage, uh, uh, sexual, immor sexual morality within marriage is blessed by God, but not outside and definitely not to be displayed to the public. But it says here, you may not be the one on screen, but by watching it, you approve of those yes. who practice and you are just mm. as guilty as those who are participating. You must adopt what the, the David, Psalmist, David the Psalmist said in one, Psalm 101 verse three, 
I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the works of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Don't allow pornography. It has destroyed families. It's like, it's like mental alcoholism. Yeah. Yes. So many people are unable to have a normal sexual relationship in the confines of marriage because they have altered their minds. And we're living in a world today that you don't even want to expose yourself to that. A lot of young men and even young women is talk about today that the women and the men are battling this and it's most silent among women because they don't want to talk about it. Yes. And, um, but it's a dark and dark thing. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And Paul talking about the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19, notice what he says. For the works of the flesh are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Tell me that sexual immorality and pornography is not lewdness and all those things described together. It's lewd. And then he says in verse 21, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And finally, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 15, speaking about those who did not make it, it says, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. So sexual immorality on all levels, heterosexual immorality, homosexual immorality, pornography, every aspect of it is condemned in the Bible and there is no age where it's permissible even within the marriage. That's right. That's right. So no, not even as a couple watch it. Anyway, we are going to go on a break and when we come back, we'll have a few closing thoughts. So stay tuned. If you're enjoying our 3ABN Bible Q&A, then tell your friends. Each Monday, we'll bring you a fresh program answering the Bible questions you send us, using God's Holy Word to shed light on those texts that seem difficult to understand. To have your questions answered on a future program, just email them to us at BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. That's BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. You may also text your questions to 618-228-3975. That's 618-228-3975. Be sure to include your name and where you live, and then watch 3ABN Bible Q&A for answers from God's Word. Welcome back. I hope you were blessed the way I was blessed. I certainly hope so. Well, we have a few th closing thoughts we'd like to share with you. I'm going to start with Pastor John Dinsey. Go ahead and share with us. There was a second question I never got to concerning... Yes. Uh, women offering sacrifices for forgiveness, forgiveness of sins. Uh, according to the priesthood, women were not allowed to be priests. But if you're talking about if a woman commits a, a sin, yeah. will she offer, bring a sacrifice? Yes, you can go to Numbers 5, 6, speak unto the children of Israel, when a man or woman shall commit any sin that uh -huh. men commit to do a trespass against the Lord and that person be guilty. And you yeah. can continue reading to understand what they have to do. All right, mm -hmm. women too, I like that. Okay, All right. Pastor Ryan Day. You know, on the issue of clapping hands in church, I know oh, yeah. somebody's <laughs> gonna send me some papers <laughs> because there's some articles written out there. I've read the articles, I've studied this thoroughly. I know there's even been some presentations given on this and some series, um, but from a biblical perspective, that's what right. I was trying to give was a biblical answer. Keep it Christ-centered and Christ-focused and not man-focused. Amen. That's right, and I wanna just say back on this last question I add, be very careful. This is the day and age where the cell phone could be the most damaging, deadly device in the hand so of a child. So. Uh, a good, very well-known man by the name of Simon Sinek talks about, he said, when mm. you give a child a cell phone, you might as well say to them, there's the alcohol cabinet, have at it. Yeah. And so many children are being exposed by that device to things that were not even intended for adults to be exposed mm. to. So if you have children, don't let them take their cell phones to bed. Their minds are not sleeping. They are delving into a demonic world. Pray for them and establish some regulations in your family. That's right. Wow. Well, thank you so much, panel. Did an amazing job. Should I applaud you? <laughs> <laughs> well, until next time, continue to trust in God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. Have a blessed day. <laughs>